this is Phil, and I'm here to tell you all about the Capes and Lunatics Patreon. Get early access to all of our interviews, including the monthly Chichester chats with writer and comic book legend D.G. Chichester, new episodes of classic Capes and Lunatics shows, including The Quantum Zone, This Thatter the Third, and many, many more specials, all completely uncensored. Access starts for $3 a month, full video when you pledge $5 a month. Check out the link in our show notes, or go to patreon.com slash capesandlunatics. Hope to see you there. And red, ripped from a corpse so freshly dead, together with our hellish hate, we'll burn you all. That is your fate. This is Red Lantern Russell from Homes of Evil, and you're listening to Sector 2814, a Green Lantern podcast. In brightest day, in blackest nights, no evil shall escape my sight. But those who worship evil's might, beware my power. Green Lantern's light. Hello and welcome back to Sector 2814, the Green Lantern Pod. Well, this week, Red Lantern Podcast. I am Phil. Joining me, as always, master of all the course, it is. I am Will, and I won't be sleeping tonight. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> After that intro. <laughs> wow! Anyway, that's right, kids. This time we're covering uh, Red Lanterns 1 through 4. More new, 50, more new 52. And hey, Will read some more new books, so we're going to talk that. Yeah, I finally caught up. <laughs> uh. Oh, hey, I was going to ask you. I just talked to... Um, was it last week I talked to Mark Russell about, um, I don't know if you saw any of uh, Superman uh, Superman Space Age or Batman Dark Age, where he basically is writing the characters, but it's like they're kind of aging in real time, so like he writes them over oh, decades okay. and stuff. And like he was saying, after he he's doing those two for sure but then like he's hoping dc lets him do more like a wonder woman and he mentioned he wanted to do like a green lantern if they would let him so oh cool that would be interesting that sounds yeah. cool very cool where they would like actually age like the, the show perhaps <laughs> yes 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 uh, veteran green lantern hal jordan um with rookie uh john stewart <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, you said uh, you read the new Lantern book. So yeah, what did you think? What Green Lantern fifteen and zero the zero hour special? So what did you think? Well, we got to talk about Hal first, right? I mean, it's just well, yeah, yeah, yeah expected, yeah. right? Um, well, I yeah, thought this, fifteen was really good. Uh-huh. Um, it, it gets back to that kind of sci-fi, you know, sci-fi hero that that Hal, you know, was kind of built from, and you know, it's like oh. Well, the plane's going down. Okay, I'm going to jettison. Well, I solved that problem. Now the problem is I don't have a parachute. Okay, how can I solve this problem to get to the, solve the next problem to solve the next problem to solve the next problem? How'd you like that? How'd you like that? Oh, yeah, when the plane makes that noise, it means it's going to blow up. What? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, he's just, he's, I think the, the, one of the things that really, you know, I really like about Hal is that he's he's just on that edge of recklessness, right? <laughs> Just um, but not past the edge. Usually, <laughs> just right on that edge. Yes. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. Um, I, I absolute power's been fine. Um, mm-hmm. but I'm anxious to get back to our story. Yes. You know, which is the lanterns and the United Planets and, and all that. Now the the backup with um with John Stewart, I thought was good. You know, it's Philip Kennedy Johnson. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was good. Again. You know, and this isn't necessarily a criticism of the story. It's more, you know, like, why isn't what I want to see in there, which is what, because what's there is good. It's just we've been waiting a really long time for what is the uh, the current situation <laughs> with John Stewart, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a tease. It's kind of like, hold on a little bit longer. It's coming. So it's... Yeah. So, you know, I enjoyed the War Journal series. But I was hoping for some more answers about, you know, just what is the new status quo. And, I mean, there's another John out there. There's another Zanshi out there. There's potentially another Kat Matui out there. We could theoretically finally get Kat Matui back Mm -hmm. um, from her being fridged before fridging was a thing. You know, it's really, it's kind of a double insult because she gets fridged, but then... She's not remembered for it. Alex is remembered for it from from Kyle. Exactly, so, exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, 
I, uh, I, yeah, I enjoyed Green Lantern 15. I also enjoyed the uh, Zero Hour 30th Anniversary Special. It was, first off, Zero Hour cannot have been 30 years ago. Uh, every, everybody that says it is is a bunch of lying liars. Okay? <laughs> it's not been 30 years since Zero Hour. That's right. I'm still in high school, damn it. <laughs> That's right. I'm still in college, but whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was good. I thought some of the... I, I don't know that some of the artists on some of the stories necessarily worked the best for those stories. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm not going to name names or anything. I mean, the art was good. It's just I, I don't know that they... Because it was kind of some different styles that really contrasted, you know, when they were one right after the other. Mm. And it was kind of jarring. But uh, well, you, well, you know why? Because uh, most of them weren't Daryl Banks. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, I thought that was pretty good. You know, you and I were talking, you know, before we before we went on that uh, I, I felt like they wrote Kyle a little too rookie-ish. Yeah, it seemed like I don't know they were trying to homage like yeah, zero hours when he kind of first started. But yeah, he kind of seemed yeah, what behind the ears? I'm just. I told you at first that seemed like to me, I was like, wait, is this set back in that, that time period? Mm-hmm. No, no. Cause we got an editor's note that says, yeah, it takes place right before the current green lantern number eight. So, yeah. So yeah, I thought that was a little bit, I mean, cause Kyle's been to the other side of the source wall and back. He's, he's not a noob. He's not no. behind the ears. He, he knows things. And it, I just felt like it took, it took time too much time for him to tumble to the fact that this was in, you know, another you know an alternate reality or something like that because i feel like he should have picked up on that pretty pretty quickly yeah just based on his experience level because he's he's not a rookie Mm -mm. i agree with you 100 percent. yeah i know that was that was my one thing as i said it seemed weird to me because i was like oh i guess this is supposed to be current but because again what it's like what you're not what wally what what who are you what it's like (laughs) i think that we got to see Azrael. we got to see jack knight starman yes we got to see uh, Warrior Guy Gardner, we got to see, <laughs> we got to see Batgirl and Supergirl, and you know, it was mm-hmm. some, I mean, it was cool. It was very cool. And then there was the Ray. Uh, Ray was in there. Um, yes, there was some. Uh, they 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 got most of the '90s characters. You know, they hit most of them. So, and for some of our fans, yes, uh, Bruce Wayne was still in a wheelchair. Batman, yes, my favorite character. And Superman was uh, spoilers. Still dead. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoyed it. It was, you know, it was kind of a, kind of a hoot to see some of those, those '90s characters that we really haven't seen in, you know, some of them, you know, decades almost at this point, right? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I, I <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Again, I agree with you completely. Yes, it was a real hoot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, but. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, because some of the because I know they had done that with uh, like Death and Return of Superman. They did like 30th anniversary specials for those. I was like, oh, I wonder if Zero Zero was all right. Yeah, like I said, it was great. It was fine, except for Kyle just seemed a little naive. Yeah, I thought it was it was good. Now, uh, spoilers. So if you don't want to hear about the ending of the Zero Hour 30th anniversary special, uh, mute, pause it right mute, now. Mute us. Pause it right now. Uh, you you have a moment. So. Okay, uh, now we're going to talk about the ending of it, and I don't know what it means, Phil. Uh, you, you were asking me before I read it, and I read it. I'm like, oh, this is what he meant. I don't, I don't know. I mm-hmm. don't understand either, because it looks like the parallax from the alternate reality is now in uh, in the DC universe, the main DC universe. So what? What does that mean? Yeah, because uh, wasn't it like in the story they explained there was a piece, there a piece of parallax, or he copied himself yeah. and said basically in in uh, time trapper fashion, kind of fashion this pocket universe, pocket which universe. Yeah, basic, I've never seen that before. <laughs> yes, which basically was the world, the DC universe of nineteen ninety four. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I. But it, you know, and there was a. But again, yeah, oh, but, you know what that proved? How was a dirty, dirty liar? Because during the original Zero Hour, wasn't he like, "Oh, I'll fix uh, stuff for everybody." You know, I'll make it. I'll give everyone a perfect universe. Meanwhile, Superman's still dead. Batman's still in a wheelchair. I'm like, he didn't fix it for them. Well, you know, Batman was was mean to him. So there you go. Oh yeah, I I, I, <laughs> I have heard Batman is mean. Yes. Into the dark <laughs> night, all to do with Batman. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't disagree with you there, but yeah, I thought it was weird that that 
piece of parallax or whatever is now loose in the DC universe. Is he just part of our parallax that, you know, came back? Cause he's, you know, you said it was like a piece that broke off, mm-hmm. but you know, we don't, the emotional spectrum at this point is in chaos. You know, we've got sorrow, um, who showed up during the, you know, the green lantern book, which I didn't even really talk about Carol and, Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and her, you know, encounter with him. But, uh, it was, I'm wondering if that's going to be a piece that may play into, you know, whatever's going on with the emotional script, because that would be kind of cool setting it up in a, you know, a 30th anniversary book. Um, you know, and parallax is the only entity that we have right now. And I, you know, you and I, what was it just last week or the week before last, we're talking about, Hey, we just built all these really cool toys with all of the different lantern core. Oh yeah. We're just going to blow up the blue lanterns now. They're gone. Yes. Yes. The yellow, you know, Sinestro Corp. Yeah, they're gone too. Whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, we still have the Red Lanterns. We still have Larflees. Uh, the Zamarans are ready to blow up their core. Uh, you know, <laughs> with the Star Sapphires. And you know, we don't really know what's going on with, uh, you know. Well, I'll explain what's going to what's going on with the Indigo Tribe. Knock, 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 knock. There you go. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> So that brings us to Red Lanterns, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So, yes, I have uh, synopses for these. I have covers for these. So let's jump into here. You bet. All right. So, all right, kids. Red Lanterns number one. There it is. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> yeah, I'm interested to get your thoughts on this. All right. Red Lanterns number one from... Uh, where's the date at? <clears throat> Sorry, kids been a few days november 2011 with blood and rage <laughs> writer peter milligan penciler ed bennis uh anchor rob hunter colorist nathan iring letterer carlos m manguel and editors Dar- darren sean and brian cunningham so we've got a we got a, some uh different names here so mm-hmm. yeah i mean peter milligan's kind of known for his vertigo work yes you know, before this so um yeah, it's an interest. It's a very interesting take, and I'd say I enjoyed it. Um, but we'll get into that after yeah. we talk about all of them. All right, in deep space, Sector Six Six Six, a ship of sadistic blue skin torturers are bored with their current victims, expressing a desire for new fare. Unfortunately for them, the prompt arrival of Dex Star, the Red Lantern <laughs> space cat, doesn't prove to be as amusing as anticipated. Dex Star scalps one of the lead torturers, but is injured and captured by the rest of the crew. Enter Atrocitus, who swiftly massacres everyone on board while internally lamenting that he appears to be losing his motivation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he yes he didn't uh, massacre them with the gusto and uh, energy he yeah. used to. He, he's he's uh, he's lost his groove. That's right. <laughs> Meanwhile, in small Octon, UK, Sector 2814, a war veteran is resisting a mugging at the hands of Baxter, a street thug. Baxter kills him in a rage. Returning to Yizamalt, Atrocitus tenderly lays his cat down for healing before turning his attention to his brawling Red Lantern Corps, who struggle to string together a coherent thought between them. Belize, remember her, singles herself out as possessing the greatest focus among them, demonstrating potential insolence and causing Atrocitus to doubt his influence over his core. Owing to a lack of intelligent confidence, Atrocitus resorts to confiding in the corpse of Crona, mad, former Mad Guardian and his greatest enemy. We learn through flashback of Crona's manhunters and the massacre of Sector 666, Atrocitus's great personal loss and witnessing the killing of his wife and child and his frustration at the vengeance denied him when oh it's oh boy someone someone uh had a little slip here uh i think a freudian slip it says uh in the synopsis it says guy gardner killed crona no that was how that was how how <laughs> you, you, you would you would expect guy but no it was how yeah. <laughs> on earth <clears throat> John Moore narrowly misses the death of his grandfather in a hospital bed, much to the anger of his brother, Raymond. The grandfather was the mugging victim seen earlier. <coughs> Raymond takes out his grief on John, who, off- who offends him with his tight rein over his emotions. Raymond punches his brother and walks away. Back on Yizamalt, Atrocitus performs a blood prophecy using Crona's blood. 
The resulting vision shown a great many people throughout the universe who must be punished for their actions, refueling his rage and redefining his motivation as an instrument of vengeance. But to fulfill his vision, he recognizes that he will need greater help from his Red Lanterns, those whose loyalty he is beginning to doubt. Uh, thoughts? I thought this was a pretty good issue. Um, I mean, we kind of got to... We haven't really seen much of Atrocitus other than, you know, uh, bloody killy guy, right? Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> so this is kind of interesting. And I, I really... I don't know who came up with it. Probably Peter Milligan. But having him use the body of Krona as, you know, someone to talk to, I thought was just awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that... Was, uh, that which you know we come back to at the end of number four, but we'll you know we'll get to that. But yeah, I thought this, was, I thought this was a really, you know, I'm gonna say something, and, and you may think I'm crazy, but confine it to this reason. I think maybe this was the strongest number one issue of the four books. Mm, I can see that. I can see that because it did a really good job introducing you know Atrocitus, mm-hmm. giving his backstory, introducing the core and their their inherent lack of intelligence <laughs> you know <laughs> and uh, you know kind of setting up where they're going to go from here you know it's kind of hey how's the trust that's going to get his groove back you know so there's a you know an overriding plot that started yeah. and green lantern was just a continuation it wasn't a number one issue to reintroduce people uh new guardians was i think probably second only to this book uh with it being you know a first issue establishing what's going on uh and green lantern core was more of a continuation let's have john kill lots of people type thing you know <laughs> yeah i know so uh, yeah i would say that this is probably this I, I think probably the strongest of the four books to come out of new 52 i i ha- yeah i did enjoy these but i was wondering do you think again it is good storytelling in these issues but do you also think part of it is that we have preconceived notions about who we think the green lanterns are especially the earth green lanterns and we don't have as many as with atrocitus Oh, absolutely. And two, I think, I mean, there's certainly not, there, there's no lack of uh, body count here. Uh, but I but you expect that for Red Lanterns. Yes, exactly. We kind of expect that. So, you know, the body count in uh, Green Lantern Corps, you know, that's somewhat shocking to a certain degree and kind of unwanted, I think, you know, based on the history of the Corps and, you know, pre- the previous series. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I... I, I do think some of our preconceived notions about what a Green Lantern core book should be, a Green Lantern book should be, or you know, even a, and I think if you look at New Guardians and you look at Red Lanterns, those are books that don't really have a, we don't have those expectations for them because you know they were they were new books, right? So yeah, I think that's a great point. Oh, and I didn't even notice this, but then note here, uh, thanks to the events of Flashpoint, Vion and Vice, the Red Lanterns are, be- are uh, who were previously killed are back because you know because. Flashpoint, New Fifty Two. So, uh, uh, um, okay. <laughs> it says, it says they pre- it says they previously fell in the War of Light and Blackest Night, respectively. So, oh, okay. I think it said I think it said Boudica uh, killed one of them. So, oh, well, welcome back, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, man. You know, New Fifty Two. They're like, hey, you know, can I bring back the two Red Lanterns? Oh, sure. Why not? The universe has <laughs> been rebooted. Why not? Uh. Oh. Yeah, and you know, I, I have to say, you've probably got one of the uh, one of the, the the Red Lanterns I'm most looking forward to reading about behind your image on the screen. Oh, <laughs> what up top? No, yeah, the, the one in the middle. Oh, the one in the middle. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Long haired, bearded guy gardener. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for guy. Yeah, Supergirl guy. That's gonna be yeah that. that it gets crazier, kids, though. Yes. <laughs> this is nothing. Jeez. All right. Ready for number two? You bet. Rock on, man. All right. Well, let's get that cover up there. We got. Oh, this was the weirdest one. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> looks like it looks like a almost like a recruitment poster for little Red Lanterns. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> Red Lanterns number two from December 2011. Pure Rage. Uh, same team. On Yizamalt, Atrocitus considers the vastness of the universe and the cacophony of its competing injustices. He asks his long-dead confidant, Krona, if he remembers 
Gahan four, or Gahan nine, a planet in constant conflict between the technologically superior peacekeeping Uvers and the indigenous Ganites. It is a perfect furnace for rage and pain. On the planet Gahan nine, two Uver jets are patrolling the skies. The pilot of one jet, Har, and Nap have both recently lost a colleague to Ganian rebels. Har is furious with Nap for suggesting that some Gahanians were not terrorists, but Nap insists he just wants to get home to his family and couldn't see why the Uvers needed to stay. All debate is cut short, however, when a ground-to-air missile suddenly takes out their companion craft. Reflexively, Har determines to retaliate on the closest body uh, detected on radar. <clears throat> Nap isn't comfortable, isn't even certain the target is hostile, but then he spies weapons and they both open fire. On the ground, some terrified Gahanian children who have been playing with sticks attempt to evade the aircraft strafing. Two, <clears throat> two brothers are killed, but their sister survives. While Har celebrates his payback with a reserved nap, the rage of the Gahanian girl attracts the attention of Atrocitus. While debating with himself the, the worth of one rage over another, Atrocitus shakes off the Uver's firepower by using the girl's rage to revive his own. He then tears into the jet and snatches Nap from his seat leaving hard to plummet to his death in the damaged craft. A distressed Nap calls his assailant a monster, but Atrocitus soon makes his point when depositing Nap on the ground among the mutilated bodies of the children recently slain. Atrocitus identifies himself as an instrument of justice, one who will wreak vengeance on behalf of the defenseless. Nap challenges, challenges this, arguing that if Atrocitus were to destroy Nap, he would also be destroying the lives of Nap's wife and child. After incinerating him, Atrocitus considers that Nap probably made a good point. <laughs> yeah. does, does, does rage simply beget more rage? His internal doubt is once again focused by the simple rage of the surviving girl, who reminds him dearly of his own lost daughter. Atrocitus is, is, a te is tempted to recruit the girl to the Red Lanterns as a member of, as a reminder of what he is fighting for, but the girl is terrified and he apologetically lets her go. Returning to Yizamalt and Krona, Atrocitus concludes that it is a complex universe, but there is certainly some rage more worthy of vengeance than others. He now recognizes that to face the challenges that he has set himself, he will require intelligent help. He will need to increase the consciousness of one of his unthinking lanterns to a level mo almost equal to his own. And if you read our, and if you listen to our coverage of uh, New Guardians, you have an idea who might that might be. Exactly. Yeah, yeah this is this actually, you know, I, I feel like we're getting to a little bit of philosophy here, which I think is good because this is mm. not just you know, rage destroy, rage destroy, you know, napalm vomit that kind of stuff. Um, but he considers himself an instrument of justice. Mm -hmm. But vengeance and justice are two vastly different things yeah i mean do you think it, i mean yeah before before new 52 that you know atrocities just seemed like you know yeah like another villain it just you know mm -hmm. I'll, I'll kill anything in my way now do you think it's almost like they're kind of like trying to paint him almost as an anti-hero I, th I think so because they want they want us to understand what what he's doing and why he's doing it now again he thinks he's you know justice but does this mean and I'll be honest, I don't know the answer to this. Is that where Peter Milligan was going with this? Because I don't think he lasts too long on this book, unfortunately. So whatever plans we originally had are going to get thrown into chaos. Yeah, you know, yeah. At some point. I haven't read all the issues, though. I can't. I don't remember where. The, yeah, but eventually, Atrocitus is going to get ousted here. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, I think one of the things that that people do that sometimes annoys me is, you know, they say that there's the good side of the emotional spectrum and the bad side of the expect. The, there aren't any good and bad sides. There's just the spectrum too much of any of those things is bad. Mm -hmm. Too little of any of those things is bad. So that balance, you know, the, the, the fulcrum at the center, which is will, uh, you know, keeps all that stuff in check. Hi. I'm a, <laughs> but, um, I mean, because, you know, rage can certainly be a good thing and is sometimes required. Yes. Um, well, yeah, well, yeah I, I mean, that's the whole, <clears throat> that's the old argument. That's like, there's no bad emotions. It's, it's how you use them. Yeah, it's like, exactly. you, it's like you can be angry at an injustice, but then that could spur you on to take, 
mm-hmm. action to improve I don't know your life or other people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. And unless you're Hal Jordan, you know, a little bit of fear probably will keep you alive. You know. <laughs> oh man, did you just burn Hal Jordan? <laughs> I just did. <laughs> Who is this? Who is this guy I'm podcasting with? Jeez. I of course love Hal Jordan. But I mean, you know, that's, you know, I'm sorry, and I'm going to call out the uh, the Jeffrey Thorne run again. Him only dealing with half of the emotional spectrum, I, I that just doesn't make sense. That doesn't ring true because it's not what anyway i will i will stop before i get ranty and uh we can continue on sir get off <laughs> get off my lawn <laughs> all right go to um, red lanterns number three. Oh, actually i did it before we hop sure. into number three i just remembered i thought it was weird that the red lanterns don't just have rings going out mm. you know you have great rage in your heart he was going to take that that yeah, girl back to his malt to make her a red lantern. You know, I thought the rings functioned a lot like the other rings because, you know, when Hal was on in the rage of the red lanterns arc, yeah, when he was on there and Lyra got killed, you know, he was enraged for a minute and boom, a ring locked onto him. And there you go. So I, this, this army of red lanterns that exists, it doesn't seem to be, you know, 3,600 or 7,200 strong, you know, mm-hmm. like, like the other Lantern Corps, you know, of course, you know, leaving out Marfleys, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> I mean, again, is there like, I mean, have we seen like any like sentient AI or anything in these rings? And again, too, I mean, you, you, you got to take a dunk in those waters too, right? All that blood, whatever. I, well, what about Guy? Did he just get a ring slapped on him? I think, I think, yeah, I don't think we, I don't think yeah, he took it. Because that was during Blackest Night, right? You know, he was, Kyle was dead. Mm-hmm. dead <laughs> quote unquote dead yeah and he, you know the ring chose him so I'm, I'm curious about how how many rings there are and are they out recruiting or is it really kind of this because that doesn't seem to be very you know sustainable to get a lot of yeah i mean a lot of well too i don't know it doesn't seem like atrocitus was actively recruiting either i mean he he just happened across this girl otherwise i don't think he was thinking about recruits Mm -hmm. maybe he just was small yeah yeah anyway that's that was one thing i noticed and i just remembered that i wanted to to bring it up yeah i didn't think of that all right now we're gonna pull the hitchcock yes woman in shower all right yeah (laughs) uh yeah uh that's (laughs) glee's (laughs) <laughs> Although that's not, that's not the way she goes in the water so, or the blood, whatever. No. <laughs> All right. So, Red Lanterns number three, January twenty twelve. Higher consciousness. Uh, same team. Blee sinks, struggling down into the depths of the blood ocean on Yizamalt, having been thrown in by Atrocitus. He intends for the ocean to restore to Blee some control of her intelligence over her Red Lantern rage. Rage, pain, and hatred cloud her mind as Blee's plummets further downward. Suddenly, among the ancient bones on the bottom of the ocean, Blee's achieves some clarity. As she pushes for the surface, she is assaulted by a torrent of memories. Her mother's murder at the hands of her erstwhile Sinestro Corps suitor, her subsequent torture on ranks, uh, Blee screams. Meanwhile on Earth, Raymond Moore is confronting Baxter as grandfather's murderer outside of Baxter's home. Light, uh, lighting a homemade firebomb, his attack is ruined by the arrival of his brother Jack. They fight as Jack attacks his brother for being dangerously foolish, but he soon stands down, refusing to see the point and getting angry. Raymond smashes him in the mouth, wrongfully accusing him of cowardice. <clears throat> Back on the shore of the blood ocean, Belize is confronting Atrocitus. Atrocitus expects gratitude for having returned her intelligence, but Belize is furious and traumatized from the consequential return of her men memories to alleviate the trauma and expedite her assistance with controlling his red lanterns atrocitus takes please back to her home world havania uh please is unimpressed until atrocitus reveals that he had recently learned the identity of two jilted former suitors of hers count lib and baron gauze as an act of revenge these two had arranged the attention of the sinestro Corps suitor who was ultimately responsible for her torture on ranks before Belize acts on this intelligence, she insists on visiting her dead mother's crypt. Atrocitus is appalled at this sentimentality, but acquiesces when Belize highlights his own uh, veneration for his long-dead family. 
Belize carefully spits on her mother's face for constantly arranging all the suitors that caused so much grief before tearing off to attack the house of Count Lib. She and Atrocitus catch the Count and Baron as they try to escape, not wasting any time in tearing the Baron's head off. <laughs> Count Lib pleads for his life and Belize threatens to grant it to him so that he may live the rest of his life in fear and contemplation of any future visit from her. Atrocitus is unimpressed with Belize's subtleties and slaughters Lib on the spot. After returning to Izumal, Atrocitus discovers that Belize has a natural influence over the other Red Lanterns. He is, si he is simultaneously impressed and concerned, for he suddenly finds himself wondering if Belize had created the upheaval among his Lanterns in order to force Atrocitus' hand in returning her intelligence. He will have to be careful of Belize. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I, I thought this took a very interesting turn uh, mm -hmm. just because, I mean, there was no shortage of, you know, Red Lantern murdery stuff, yes. you know, so there, there's that. But, uh, you know, it's kind of become a little bit of a, a political book, you know, because they're, you know, he's talking about, the, you know, the Red Lantern followers and Blees and mm -hmm. influence and things like that. I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm of two minds because Atrocitus really... He comes off as very, uh, not very confident at all in his ability to, to command the troops. I mean, he's immediately paranoid about, you know, Blees. And I, I don't know, I don't know if that's a great aspect of him, you know, or a, a great aspect of his character, or if that's something because he's a Red Lantern, so you know, he sees things everywhere. I, I'm still trying to decide, but I, I thought it was interesting. I think the Red Lantern thing plays into a little bit, but I mean, when was the whole massacre of Sector 666? Was it millions of years ago? Billions of years ago? Yeah. That whole time, he was lusting after revenge for Krona. Now that's been taken from him, so after millions, billions of years, he has no purpose in his life. His family's dead. Krona's yeah. dead. It's like, well, now what? Yeah. Vengeance. After Justice. yeah, after after you obsessed over something for millions of years, I mean, I mean, look what's happening with the Guardians. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Guardians. <laughs> I know, but I but I did like that point at the end, yeah, where he was like, yeah, even though she was like barely had a mind, like even just animalistically, was she just like, yeah, I'm gonna rile up the troops so he has no choice but to give me back my intelligence. I mean, that's. That's crazy, but hey, stranger things have happened, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and again, I mean, these are all different alien species. Who knows, you know, how her people are. Yeah, but I mean, it, there, there's a really kind of, you know, Machiavellian streak here going on with between, you know, competition, I guess, between Bleas and maybe, maybe Bleas and Atrocitus. But, mm -hmm. you know, is it in his mind? Is she actively doing it? Because she's not unintelligent anymore. I mean, she originally she was smart. Mm -hmm. but now she's no longer the mindless, you know, red lantern. She's got her intelligence back. So is she, does she want to be in charge? Is she trying to take Atrocitus down? I don't know. Or is it just, you know, some paranoid dream of, of Atrocitus? Mm -hmm. Is he looking for someone to kill him because the thing that he's wanted most has been denied him and he can't get it back. <laughs> Yeah, again, uh, yeah, like you said, I love the writing. It's like, is he paranoid or does he have a reason to be? Uh... Yeah, I think this is a really good issue. I mean, and it it uh, it showed, you know, we got some great backstory on Blee's, um, you know, as she was sinking down through the the blood lake. And, um, you know, it's this book, I think, has got a really good balance of giving us all the backstory we need, uh, as well as moving forward with. The characters oh, yeah. I, I think it's good very good and again uh, like i don't uh, again like i said about preconceived notions and again i don't think i mean as good as this stuff as jeff johns did i don't think with all the cores going on at the same time he didn't have a ton of time to really flesh out the red Lan red lanterns yeah it was uh i mean it was pretty much once sinestro core hit yeah after it it was a dead sprint to get to yeah. blackest night and again, and, we, and he, we got some of the origins, like we had seen Blee's origin before, yeah. but yeah, mm -hmm. nothing like in depth. Yeah. And, you know, when I say, a, you know, a dead sprint to Blackest Night, that includes that seven issue stretch of Secret Origin. I mean, that yeah. was foundational because we had to have that, that backstory that played into previous stuff and also set up a lot of stuff for Blackest Night. So, I mean, it was, yes. it was all very economical and... And 
to to that end, you know, yes. toward Blackest Night. Yes, that dead sprint to the zombie uh, story. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, ready for the last one? You bet. All right. Uh, there we go. Green or green? Red Lanterns number four. <laughs> I've been trained 100 and 191 episodes of green, green. <laughs> All right. So Red Lanterns number four from February 2012. The Departed. Same team. On Yizamalt, Atrocitus accosts Skalox away from the rest of the Red Lantern Corps. He's attempting to discern if his lanterns are plotting against him. As Skalox is incapable of delivering an intelligent answer, Atrocitus bites down on Skalox's neck drinking his blood and tapping directly into a blood vision showing Skalox's recent experiences. It is an unclear vision with Blees addressing the lanterns prior to her recent return to intelligence. But Atrocitus is certain that he hears the words Atrocitus, kill, and possible. He hasn't learned enough, but his vision is interrupted by the arrival of Blees in person. Ignoring her challenge, he determines to pitch Skalox immediately into the blood ocean. In a fit, Zilius Zox and Ratchet are also thrown in, recognizing recognizing that she herself only barely survived her blood ocean reawakening. Belize questions Atrocitus's wisdom and possibly condemning to madness three of his most valuable lanterns. Underneath the surface of the ocean, we see Ratchet beginning to remember. Prior to becoming a Red Lantern, Ratchet once possessed a pink, fleshy torso beneath his bulbous, brain-like head. He also had two arms and legs that were effectively main tentacles, and at 138 years old he considered himself to be the to be in the prime of his life his people had evolved to be isolationists in following the words of the holy voice of brax long may he be alone in fact any physical contact among his people had become illegal a harshly punishable offense despite this ratchet was determined to franchise fraternize arranging to secretly meet like-minded individuals their meeting is raided by the isolation police and all are arrested while the three lanterns are enduring the blood ocean process, Atrocitus has returned to the corpse of Crona to confide his concerns about Blees. His, conjunct- his conjuncture is interrupted when he is noticed when he notices a hidden figure in the distance watching him. In a rage, he assumes it to be Blees and pursues the figure, but ultimately is given the slip. Sick of the complexities of leadership, Atrocitus takes his frustrations out on an evil sect in Sector 495 that blinds its daughters at puberty. He then moves to Earth where he destroys an extravagant government vehicle of a starving nation and burns a violent husband who had abandoned his family. Once again, Atrocitus is forced to come to terms with the fact that he cannot single-handedly deliver retribution for all the rage in the universe. He now considers that Earth may provide him with some new recruits. In small Ockton, England, Raymond Moore is now seeking refuge from the police at Jack Moore's apartment. John hasn't forgiven his brother since their previous fight and refuses to help his brother, arguing that some time with the police might do him some good. The police knock on the door. Meanwhile, in Skalax's blood ocean memories, we learn that he was once a loyal lieutenant to his criminal boss, Lancer. However, when a valuable product went missing, Skalax's well-earned trust earns, earns him nothing when Lancer gives the order to torture him and find the truth. Neither of the three Red Lanterns have yet emerged from the ocean when Atrocitus returns to Yizamal. He considers their possible loss a risk worth taking as he needs potential allies against Blees. For the time being, he is forced to admit to himself that the only person he can safely confide with is his dead nemesis, Krona. It is a, n- <laughs> it is a nasty shock that awaits him, uh, therefore, when he discovers that Krona's corpse has disappeared. Dead man Which walking. Is a great, a great ending, by the way. Yes, and that is that is an awesome cliffhanger. There's a cliffhanger. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I thought this was a. I don't know that this issue was as good as the previous ones because it seems like we're in transition, you know, with some things. Yeah, it was almost like, hey, let's do more origins of some Red Lanterns while Atrocitus go, yeah. goes and does whatever. Yeah, yeah, does its thing. Um, but you know, it's still good, and I. I think overall, these first four issues are really strong. I mean, Mm -hmm. as far as, uh, you know, if the goal is to launch a new title and, you know, give backstory and give, you know, kind of the overarching structure and, you know, what what it's going to be about, I'm hard pressed to find, you know, any of the other Lantern books that 
did as good a job of this one. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, you know, I think I think New Guardian started really strong those first four issues, but I think it lost its way kind of with that whole other solar system thingy going on out there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think I would still I think I would still put this at the top. Oh. Uh, and and new guardians now is that going to change over the next eight issues you know when we get to zero i, I don't know if milligan's going to stay the writer you know the art's gorgeous ed bennis is an, an awesome artist uh, he does have a tendency to draw female characters a certain way yeah, um, yeah. i don't i don't think that that's any secret but uh he is a, he is a good storyteller and you know, it's, a, it's good clean art um so yeah, I think I really do think that Red Lanterns is is attempting to live up to the promise of the New Fifty Two, whereas the others, I don't know. <laughs> and do you think too? Part of it, I mean, maybe it's just because Peter Milliken, we really haven't seen him on a Lantern book up until this point. But it's, you think the other three are they just like they're trying to do their best impression of Jeff Johns' stuff, but Peter Milliken's basically just trying to do something, you know, Different. what he wants to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the thing is. From a, a Green Lantern standpoint, New 52 didn't have to happen, you know, because no. we're getting the, pretty much the same stories with a little higher body count, you know, in some of them. <laughs> but uh, Yeah, really nothing has changed, no. Yeah, nothing has changed. And, you know, well, our two Red Lantern dudes are back, yes, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there was there's no reason that this book had to be launched in the New 52. It could have yeah. been launched, you know. Could have did it after Blackest Night or something, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the same with New Guardians. That could have been launched after Blackest Nights. And then we know that the Green Lantern and the Green Lantern Core book would have just kept going. So Mm -hmm. I feel like New 52 is kind of a kind of a wash at this point. You know, it doesn't really affect us. But I think as the New 52 rolls along, it definitely affects all the books a lot more. You know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think ultimately to their detriment. But that's. That's just me. Because, well, yeah, I mean, well, once again, I mean, it's probably going to hit next episode, too, because we're going to do Red Lanterns 5 through 8 and Stormwatch number 9. So, again, of course, no one's going to know who John Jones is. Well, it's Red Lantern. They might not know it anyway. But Yeah, but exactly. I mean, that because that was really jarring, you know, in Green Lantern Corps when he shows up. And I'm like, okay, and, what, what about the one punch? Don't you like Oreos? That yeah, Guy does know who he is. <laughs> guy, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it seems unnecessarily confusing let me put it that way yeah they wanted something new but then it's like they wanted to keep certain things and it's like no you either have to clear the board or yeah don't or don't do it yeah now i do there is i believe grant morrison wrote uh the rebooted action comics with an early early superman i think was it george perez on art on that um it might have been i'm trying to remember it might have been but yeah i know what you're talking about yeah grant morrison yeah they're with like yeah superman in jeans and a t-shirt yeah 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 i i have not read those i kind of want to go back to it and and i still want to i need to revisit the grant morrison green lantern uh, because i there are some there are some parts of that that i absolutely love and then there are some parts of it what the heck it's earthquake <laughs> seemed like it <laughs> everything okay over there yeah i guess <laughs> oh nothing broke <laughs> nah we mostly just focus all right <laughs> okay anyway um yeah so i uh, i've not seen anything yet that has just you know screamed out to me that said this is why we had the new 52 because of this great thing mm-hmm. and i I don't know if that's going to be that action comics run. I don't know if truthfully, I don't know if anything is actually going to be worth the havoc that was. Yeah. I mean, I saw a lot of it. I haven't read since then, but yeah, from what I remember, I don't think anything was really worth. Oh, Hey, for doing the new 52, which eventually they, I mean, they kind of turn it all around, but yeah. Well, I know that uh, red lanterns, I think only goes 40 issues. New guardians only goes 40 issues. Green Lantern makes it 52. I don't. Does Green Lantern Corps make it 52? Oh, I can't remember. I don't. I, don't, I thought it was a, it a few did. short or something. Yeah. 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 Nothing went past 52 in the, the new mm-hmm. 52. So. Oh yeah. Um. But still, I I think I enjoyed Red Lantern yeah. for what it was. Uh, it was it's different and it's good, and I'm 
curious to see where it's going, okay. at least until another writer comes off, <laughs> which I think happens pretty quickly because New 52 has a reputation, I think. <laughs> yeah, 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 for people who weren't, weren't happy, yeah. Yeah. All right, anything else? That's all I got, sir. All right, so yes, kids. So next time, like I said, we're going to do Red Lanterns 5 through 8 and Stormwatch number 9. And then in two weeks, we'll do Green La- or Green Red Lanterns 9 through 12 <laughs> and number 0. And then we'll get the week after that, we'll get back to Green Lantern. Green Lantern number 0, annual number 1, and 13 and 14. So Nice. We're ramping up to War of the, let's see, not War of the Green Lanterns, uh, Wrath, Wrath of, of the First yeah. Lantern. That's right, in the appearance of, first appearance of Simon Baz. Oh, yeah, in the Zero issue. Mm-hmm. All right, kids, so, yes, yeah, send us your thoughts. Email us, capesandlunatics at gmail.com, or call the voicemail, 614-382-2737. That's 614-38-CAPES. And remember, you can find all things Capes Lunatics episodes, social media, merchandise. Get your brand-new Capes Lunatics merch, your classic Capes and Lunatics merch. Uh, and again... You think you fear atrocities? Uh, that's nothing. Love we'll Hellfire demands that you rain random money on us through the Cash App link. Make it rain. Uh, don't make us dance on that pole, cause, well, I don't know, something, something, blood, blood, like I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's me, your old pal, the owl. Looks like she was just working a f- <laughs> stripper pole down at Divas. <laughs> And, of course, the Patreon, where you can find something different, uh, uncensored, exclusive to our patrons every month. Uh, it was a little bit of a uh, weird weird this time, because, uh, yes, I had to throw something up at the last minute, because Lilith and I really didn't record for September, because she was, she was digging out for that hurricane, so... <laughs> <laughs> no inter- she just finally got her internet back today, I know, she told me. Well, that's good. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so subscribe to the Patreon, uh, which you can find it. Why that? I don't know why the screen went. Man, what's going on tonight? <laughs> I swear I'm being haunted. All right. Uh, it is. It is the spooky season. I swear. <laughs> Some. All right, kids. So yes. Yeah, so send the. So uh, yeah. Subscribe to the Patreon at Patreon.com/slash Capes and Lunatics, and you can find everything all in one place. That's TubeSpace.io slash Capes and Lunatics Podcast Networks. TubeSpace.io slash Capes and Lunatics Podcast Network. All right, now for this Mr. Will Allred, master of the cores, master of the quantum zone, master of podcasting, and several Kickstarter, successful Kickstarter campaigns. Uh, Will, tell them about your uh, your creations. Well, you can find me at uh, Walred uh, at uh, Gmail, so that's W-A-L-L-R-E-D, at Gmail, and uh, Facebook, and Blue Sky, and Twitter, and probably some other things that I forgot to set up. And uh, like Phil said, uh, we do uh, create some comics uh, and uh, have published them via Kickstarter. We're up to number six of Crossover Division, and you can check out Crossover Division at crossoverdivision.com. We'll be launching uh, number six hopefully this month. Um, We're a little behind where we hope to be, but uh, hopefully soon. And uh, if you'd like to check out Diary of Night, which is a a book that we did a few years ago, you can do that at diaryofnight.com. And you've obviously got great taste because you're here hanging out with Phil and I listening to talk about Green Lantern, which means you probably love Marvel's Quasar nearly as much as we do. So if you'd like to find out more about Quasar, you can do that at the Quantum Zone, quantumzone.org. I'll put it in my navel. Hey, boys, you look at the party? I love the party. I hope it's going somewhere nice. They aren't even attempting to enter our orifices. <laughs> and of course. I, of course, love how Jordan. I do. Um, so, yeah, or so for... Uh crossover division are you planning on october for this month october to uh launch or yeah we were gonna try to do last month but uh some stuff didn't line up yeah. uh with the rest of the the creative team so uh, we're we're hoping to get it launched this month and uh then we're closing in on i mean i've got artists so we we usually do a kind of a alice is the alice the clerk is the artist on half the issues and then uh, Pablo Martinena is the artist on the other half of the issues. So we're trying to get a, a good TikTok kind of yeah. uh, rhythm going so that we can launch one of these hopefully every three months. We're not quite there yet, but we're, nice. we're working on it. I know because Lilith and I talked to DJ Chichester last time. He was like, I don't know if he, he got something coming soon. And he was just like, yeah, we just decided to wait till after the election to do any, you know, the, uh, social media <laughs> pushes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because, you know, I'll be posted. I'll, I'll post on social media or something, you know, and I feel somewhat guilty. I'm like, Hey, you know, buy my book, read my book. 
as the world burns around us. Well, you know? we need, distra- <laughs> you need distractions while the world's burning, you know. True. True. Oh, that's a new meme. You sitting at a table reading a crossover division thing. Like, everything's fine as the room's like in flames yeah. around you. It's, everything's <laughs> fine. Oh, and last week on Thursday, Legend of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom came out. Oh, nice. <laughs> Which is really fun, I must say. Oh, my. All right. <laughs> that's why he doesn't want to travel. All right, kids. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Come back next time. He has more Red Lanterns, 5 through 8, and Issue 0. Or no, not Issue 0, so Stormwatch. Oh, it's late, kids. It is. <laughs> it's Tuesday, and it's been a busy week. It's been a long week already. Yep, it yeah. has. <laughs> so yes, Red Lanterns, 5 through 8, and Stormwatch number 9. Got it. Yes. Yay. Uh. All right, kids, come back next time. And remember, if you're going to beg for mercy, remember the first day, please. Good night.